Okay, let's talk about installation. What we generally do, our rule of thumb, is we're going to start at the outside corner, the most visible outside corner of that room. And the way we do this is not by taking two pieces of material and bevel ripping them and bringing them together like so. Have any of you guys ever tried to do this? No, I have. And I, I did it many years ago when I was very young and even more foolish than I am now, amazingly enough. And what happened was I could never get these bevels, miters, whatever you want to call them, the technical bevels, to line up because the walls were invariably bowed, twisted, or distorted, or whatever. And I would fight these, and I thought this is the way we had to do it. And then years later, I, started, I sat there, I actually sat down and started thinking about the situation. And I said, you know what, this doesn't really look very good, number one. And number two, this is an area that's really fragile. The outside corners take a lot of wax, and there's really not a lot of meat here at this very outside corner of this material, and it was, we were seeing some splintering happen. So what we do now is we actually use a rabbited outside corner like so. This is what it's going to look like in cross-section. This is what it's going to look like when it's finished. It looks a whole lot better. There's plenty of surface area to glue and nail to, and you actually have a bead at that corner. I want to talk this, I want to segue into this. Anytime as a finished carpenter or a carpenter, period, anytime you do this, you take your tape measure out, you are wasting time and you're wasting money. I mean this sincerely. Leave your tape measure in your bags as much as possible. We want to show you all some tips to, to, for these installations using your tape measure as little as possible. So let's start with this outside corner that we're going to build. And the way that we do this is really pretty simple. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the table saw and I'm going to actually rip the tongue off of the first piece of beadboard. So this tongue right here needs to go away completely for this installation. Then I'm going to set the fence. Thanks, Ben. I'm going to set the fence, and I'm going to do this by eye. I'm going to keep the shoulder. I'm going to keep the shoulder right here lined up with the blade. And then I'm going to go through, and I'm going to rip that tongue off. Set yourself up to work safely. You're going to notice that I waited a couple seconds for the blade to stop. I do this. I'm trying to train myself to do this. I didn't always do this. Work safely is my point. Resist the temptation to reach around a spinning saw blade. Number one, rip the tongue off of this. Number one, set that off to the side. The next step is we're going to actually take our groove right here. This is going to be our mating piece. We're going to take our tongue and groove, the groove portion right here, and we're going to extend it down here. So I don't even need to take a tape measure out because I'm going to plow this, I'm going to extend this even deeper. You see the pencil mark? I'm going to extend that even deeper. How deep do I need to extend it? I need to extend it by the thickness of this piece right here. But I'm going to extend it not the full thickness. I'm going to extend it to this, there's a shoulder right in here. Let me draw a pencil line. I'm going to extend it that much. So from here to here is the distance that I need to set my... I'm sorry, Sue. Got it? From here to here is the distance of the material that I need to remove. That's the thickness. Does that make sense? You guys with me? If it's not, tell me. I'm not explaining it properly. It's what Greg was speaking about before is the way you determine those depths and the reference he was making about the tape measure is mark off of your work. Anytime you take that tape measure out, it introduces the opportunity for error. If there's one thing that you can do to really tighten your work up is it's marked directly off of your work. A good sharp pencil, if you want to go really OCD and go about a level beyond that, is mark your work with a knife. Yes. Take your piece to your job site, to your work area, mark it directly off of there and make your cuts. Absolutely. No room for error. Sorry, Ben. So what I've done is I'm sighting down the edge of this board. I'm sighting that, that bevel to the outside corner. This is not like, you know, cabinet grade work. You don't need ultra, ultra precision. It should be good. 
but we're not measuring the 64th or worse yet the 128th, which is impossible. So this is my depth. This material needs to come away. I didn't take my tip measure out, obviously, you notice that. I did all that live, standing here talking to you guys. So if I can do this, you can do this. So now I need to set the fence again. I need, I need to set the fence, first of all, to the overall height for the material that I'm going to remove. That's number one. I just did that. I recognize you can't see this. And then number two, I need to bring the fence over and I need the distance, the distance from the edge of the fence to the outside of the blade is this distance right here. And then I can go back through. Yeah, it takes a couple seconds for the blade to stop. I recognize that, but it's also safer. So there's our first pass. Everybody see that? This is our shoulder right here. That's the distance of the thickness of the material right there. Then now I need to extend this. And this is really easy because all I need to do is again, bring the fence over. And now the edge of the fence is here. The blade is here. I'm going to raise the blade to this height. And I can use this as a gauge. That's it. Measure off of your work. I normally use a push stick in this situation. This is a really short piece of material and a push stick actually would have been kind of unsafe there. So you, you notice I kept my hand up and away from the blade. This is also not what we call a through cut, meaning we're not cutting completely through the board. We're taking a piece out. So it's a little bit safer. But don't get complacent at a table. So as I said, I came really close a couple of weeks ago and it, it cost me some money rather than anything else. No matter. Alternatively, you could make that cut by doing a series of passes with that board flat and hogging the material out Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. Putting a dado stack in using a router. Absolutely. Good point. Thank you. So this is our finished corner. Does that make sense? You guys all see that? This is our corner. So this is going to withstand the impact a whole lot better. We're going to go a step further. We're not just going to plow this rabbit, which this is a rabbit joint now, and put it on the wall. We're going to pre-assemble it. We're going to, do you need to get that, Jeff? We're going to try and pre-assemble as much as we possibly can as finished carpenters, as, as anything. I do found it on the bench. to be far more efficient to pre-assemble whatever you possibly can. So here's our corner already pre-assembled. This is what it's going to look like. So I've already done this, and we just have this pinned together. Normally, we're going to take glue. We're going to glue this. We're going to pin it, usually 18-gauge. Uh, I say pins, they're brads, technically. I, I need to start using the correct terminology. We're going to brad it together with 18-gauge brads, and we're going to glue this up. Now, the benefit to this, when it's pre-assembled, is that you can actually bring it to the corner and set it in place, and you can work, you can plumb it up, left or right. If this corner is slightly out of plumb, you can make adjustments with this pre-assembled piece. It's kind of like a corner post on vinyl siding, isn't it? Yeah, there it is. <laughs> the challenge that you face when you do this is this. If we install this just like so, you've got a tongue going in this direction, which is all good, right? Because we want to install this material, we want to blind nail the material. Those of you that have installed hardwood floors or any type of beadboard material, you know you want to try and blind nail as much as possible. You can blind nail through the tongue. How do we do that here on this side? You got a groove on this side. What's that? With a spline. We can do a spline. Slip Absolutely. Down. Good good point. We can take a spline and it's going to look something like this. What's the problem with that? There's no bead. So here's the approach that we take. We come back in, and let me go back to my mock-up because it's going to be a little bit easier. We come back in and we do this. This is what we have, right? We want to keep this. We want to keep this because this is our tongue side. We're going to come back in, we, but we need a bead now. Remember, there's always a bead right by the edge of that tongue. We're going to cut this off. We're going to split this right along that bead. We're going to leave the bead intact 100%. Do not cut into the bead. This becomes waste material. And now we can do, and what you said, we can run a spline along the edge of that. Pretend I've already ripped this. Now we can go back in here and run this through the table saw on edge with a router. Slot cutter slot and a router. Cutter and put a, a spline. We call it a slip tongue. You guys call it a spline. It's the same thing. 
When you change direction with hardwood flooring, you put what's called a slip tongue in there. It's really just in cross section, it's this. It's this tongue that exists here, like so, times two. It's this plus this. So put your spline in there, and you can change direction with that. So that's how we handle that detail. And then we can go back in, and Ben, do you want to actually install that? Sure. It's probably about time we actually installed some material. And now we can go back in, and we can actually install that. Now, there are a couple of things going on here. Do you have your safety glasses? Thank, Thank you. you. I'm so used to just having them on my head. Sorry. Okay, there are a couple of things, as I mentioned. If you're going to pre-assemble this, and you're going to install this as a unit, do I need to get out of the way so you guys can see? I'm sorry. If you're going to do this and you plumb this, now you've got a challenge because something's not going something's going on with that wall that needs to be adjusted. This is one of the reasons we generally remove the drywall ahead of time. And our preferred method is to strap that wall or put blocking in because we're actually going to adjust the plane of that wall. We're going to plumb it out. We're going to correct the deficiencies that exist within that wall. Yeah, we can absolutely install plywood backing or whatever, but those deficiencies still exist in most instances. If the wall's really out to lunch, do yourself a favor and spend some extra time fixing those because they're gonna, you're going to be chasing them every step of the way otherwise. If, those, if that wall is out of plumb a little bit, you can gradually, gradually bring this back into plane. What I mean by that is if the wall's leaning a little bit and then you come to that corner and you want that corner plumb for whatever reason, you can gradually fan this material. You can do it on a couple different axes, if you will. So that's one thing. Number two, if you're working out of this corner and you cannot plumb that corner, at some point, try to plumb the beadboard because I'll tell you something, nothing looks worse. And this is why we don't like outlets and switches in our beadboard, especially if it's a little bit out of plumb, because if the outlet and switch is plumb and it's directly next to a bead, you're gonna read it. It's gonna give you a visual point of reference. You don't have to install all of your material in a house plumb, level, and square. It helps if we can do that, but we're not always able to achieve that. We recognize that. This is where the illusion comes into play. You know, it's an illusion that everything looks perfect, when in fact it's not. Alternatively, ahead, you could have then. started out here at your corner, and you could have figured out what your difference is and cut a slight taper on this. You could have gone quarter inch to nothing right here, and then made your rabbit for your corner on the backside, and you have now taken that completely out of the equation. You're starting plumb and working that way. It, I doubt anybody's eye is ever going to pick up that that corner is now out of plumb, but you're going to be seeing that the rest of the beadboard and everything that it intersects down the wall is now plumb. Absolutely, but don't do it near the bead. Don't, let me draw you an example. Don't do this. Resist the, the temptation to do this. Try and really emphasize that. Can we read that? Yeah, yeah. Now, and again, let me do it on a different case. And I won't be quite as, I won't exaggerate quite as much, but I'll absolutely put it a little bit out of plumb. Can we read that? That's actually about an eighth inch out of plumb and an only a 10 inch piece. You see my point? The eye is, the eye is like one of the best tools you have. It's, it's amazing what it can pick up. So to your point, yeah, dead on, Ben. Go ahead and uh, adjust it as necessary. Now, when it comes to actually installing the material, I know this is common sense, but you should never be using your hammer or something to knock the edge of your material in. You're going to damage it, deform it. It's going to just make your next piece harder. Um, you should always be knocking the material in with a beater block. So holding your piece in here and using this to drive your material over. Absolutely. Um, or alternatively, if you come into something that's really tough, I had some uh, pre-primed beadboard I was doing about two weeks ago that the company primed extra heavy and didn't want to drive together. I'll take a scrap of material and rip it on an angle like this. Uh, you bring it over here, screw through here, and then drive this piece right here to act as a wedge to drive the material over. This uh, is a, when you have bowed material, like I was saying, heavily painted material, material that's got bunged up tongues and edges on it that doesn't want to drive together. This is a trick that flooring contractors and deck installers use a lot of times. As you said, it'll just, it's one piece, one block, rip it diagonally. It doesn't have to be 45, 30, 60 degrees, whatever, depending on the axis. Works, and then screw one down to a firm surface, use the other, and drive against it. And it's a wedge. You know, it's a lever. That's kind of the cool thing, you know, what do they say, if, if, if I had a big enough lever I could move the world, you know, that's kind of what you're doing here. You're moving this stuff into position. 
Okay, so fan the material slightly and out of plumb corners or use Ben's method as he mentioned. One other thing, if you're going to install this material and you haven't been able to truly acclimate it and you expect that it's, it's pretty dry, maybe it's been over dried, and it's going to acclimate, meaning it's going to acclimate on the side to the point where it's going to expand, not contract, use spacers between the material. And can you show that? Or actually, you know what, I can just do it here, that's cool. Use spacers when you install the material. And what I mean by that is when you bring the material together, you bring the tongue and groove together, there's no law that says you have to do this. There's no law that says it has to be totally tight like that. You may think it looks better, but in reality, this works really well. Take a scrap. And what Greg's using for his shims right here is just scraps of plastic laminate. You can go to your plastic laminate dealer, wholesaler, whoever you have, and just pick up a, a sample ring like that. We keep them in our tool bags. I keep them in my shop. Make great shims. You can stack them and tape them together to get to certain thicknesses. Exactly. So this is what we use. We keep scraps of we call and it like peel, Greg was peel talking about, about driving the pieces together, the seasonal movement of that piece of wood in white pine is probably going to be close to a sixteenth of an inch. So don't drive yourself crazy. I'm not saying to be sloppy in your install, but don't drive yourself crazy about getting those dead tight because that wood's going to expand and contract anyways about that amount. Absolutely. The other thing is if you are going to paint it, I really recommend painting the tongues first. Always and, and stain especially. This is even truer if you're going to stain it. Paint, excuse me, stain it especially a dark color. Get some finish on that tongue because if this material does contract, meaning it opens up and it shows a little bit of that tongue, you don't want to see unfinished wood in there. If I'm doing painted uh, beadboard like this, I always either order it pre-primed or we pre-prime it ourselves in the shop. Got it. Got it. It's a lot easier. So these little P lamb spacers really work well. They're free. Most lumber yards will have them, cabinet manufacturers, distributors, whatever it might be, countertop shops. And you can often get rings for free, especially if it's like last year's models or colors or whatever. And they come already on these chains. And as Ben mentioned, we use them for shims as well, or we use them for setting thickness. But the point <laughs> is, think about all these little tips and, and try and keep the tape measure away. And use a gauge block whenever you can, especially for marking reveals, which is where we're going to go next. Okay, so any questions about any of this so far? You guys are all good. The actual installation of the beadboard is really, really simple, and it's really quick. The question Great. is, is whether you. we're shimming for movement or whether we're shimming to correct for a wall. What Greg was describing is shimming to correct for a wall. So in that scenario, when he's using those little p lamb shims, if we've got a quarter inch of lead out at the top, what we'll do is we'll take and for four pieces, we'll shim the core, the top of the piece over a sixteenth and keep the bottom tight to start cheating it. It's just like when you're coursing clabbered on a wall or something like that. You can start cheating it to make you know your lines end up where you want. Yeah. yeah. Though you absolutely could use these to shim for movement as well. As I said, if you're expecting this material to expand, absolutely. Take a piece of your p lamb, stick it between the tongue and groove, top and bottom, and there is your space. You're, you're installing this stuff in a house in the middle of January with like 20% humidity, and that material's at 5% moisture content, it's going to swell. You can go ahead and do that. Exactly. But my point is these plastic laminate shims are consistent. And that's what we're after. We're after consistency. And we're after consistency from each crew member. First off, and I'm, I'm using these more and more. I started using them for siding work years and years ago. This is a, actually a pretty good sized cutting table. The difference between this cutting table and some of the ones that you probably have seen knocked together on a work site is ours folds flat. And we do that like so. We take standard 2x4 lumber, we put cross members at 16, 24 inch centers, 12 inch centers, whatever works for you. We drive one fastener through the back into each one and then it can do this. It can fold flat and when it's folded up flat it only takes up 7 inches of space on the width or whatever the, the dimension of your cross, excuse me, of your primary members are times two. So if I've got a two by four here, two by four here, it's seven inches. This goes from 24 inches to seven inches just by doing that. It's really like great, it's, you gotta clean up and rearrange the job site or something like that. You can fold it up, tuck it out of the way, do what you have to do, reset up in your other area, throw it in the truck without it being this big cumbersome thing that's taking up a lot of space. So that's number one. Number two, we're going to actually bring this in and we're gonna set it on sawhorses, table, whatever it might be, and this is what it's going to look like. When we, when we drop this down, we're going to put it in place and we're going to 
then square it up. I'll show you why in a second. We're gonna take typically speed square, maybe a framing square if we wanna get really accurate, and we're gonna square this end. And all I'm doing is I'm taking my square and I'm doing this. And I'm squaring the cross rear, the far left cross member relative to the front rail. That's all I'm doing. And then I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna lock it into position with one screw. You'll see why in a second. So what did that just do for me? It just created square. You're gonna notice something here. What's this? It's a stop or a fence. Remember I said a few minutes ago that if we need, pick a number, I don't care, you know, 16 pieces or 60 pieces or 600 pieces at a specific measurement, here's all I need to do. I can take and I can load my material onto this cutting station. This works really well for siding. It works just as well for beadboard or any plank type, any wide material you might be cutting. And what do we need for that piece of beadboard, Ben? I don't remember the measurement. 30, 38 and a half, I think. Sounds right, but let's double check. 38 and a half. 38 and a half. Now, is this a critical dimension? No, it isn't. Not in this application because we're putting the baseboard and the cap on over the beadboard. But if this were one of those situations where we needed a really tight dimension, that's why I want to make sure that his tape is reading the same as mine so I don't give him a piece and he says, wait, man, this is a 16th too short. So I mark 38 and a half, and in this situation, I don't even need to square this. I've got 38 and a half, and I've got one piece here, I've got another piece here. In reality, I could have another piece there, I could double stack this, I could, I could cut six or eight pieces at one time with one measurement without taking the square out because then I can take my track saw and do this. It's that easy. And I just cut two, that could have been six that I cut and they're gonna be exactly the same. That's why I wanted to make sure that this end was square to the front rail because I'm gonna line my material up with the front rail. I'm gonna butt it into my stop at the end and then I'm gonna measure from there and everything is gonna be square. Yeah, thank you.